Welcome, everybody, to Ginkgo Ferment. Uh, ah. Super excited to have you all here today. I want to start by thanking Quinn and the Ferment team for this absolutely gorgeous venue we all get to be in today. So a quick round of applause for the team. OK, so I have, I have two big goals for today. So number one, I want you all to meet each other. OK, this is a carefully curated group of people. Really introduce yourself to someone you don't know at Ferment today. Take advantage of the breaks and the party tonight. And then number two, I want us all to learn from each other. So one of the things I'm most excited about is today at Ferment, the people you're going to mainly see up on stage, more than anything else, are our customers. So you're going to hear from 11 different companies talking about the applications, the products they're building on top of Ginkgo's platform. You're going to see panelists from our customers. Go check out these cool domes here in the back. You can meet with a bunch of customers and up in the library see highlights of the products that they're developing. And then tonight at the party, you're going to get to eat and drink products from Motif and Ayana Bio. All right? And, and so super excited about this. And I think it's an important point to make because people are often confused about Ginkgo. We don't make our own products here. We are a platform services company, right? So we ended last year with about $1.3 billion in the bank. I'm not spending that on clinical trials or new food products or ag products. That's all of you all. I'm spending that on platform technology to make it easier for you to get products to market. So we want to learn from you. Do not be shy, right? Tell us what is missing on Gigo's platform, what you'd like to see us change, timing, pricing, whatever it is. We want to hear it today. This really is about you, OK? All right, so before I get to our platform, I do want to take a minute and talk about what a year 2022 was for synthetic biology as a field. So this is an executive order from President Biden. came out in September. It says, we need to develop genetic engineering technologies and techniques to be able to write circuitry for cells and predictively program biology in the same way in which we write software and program computers. Hell yes. OK, you know, this, woo! All right. This, this is something, you know, those of us who've been in the field of synthetic biology for a long time have been waiting to see happen. We want to see, you know, the federal government putting, you know, synthetic biology up there with AI and semiconductors as critical technologies for the country. And I think you see that happening. This was the meeting at the White House. You see I was there right after the EO. It, you know, Mark Warner, head of Intel. You have the head of HHS, DOE, Agriculture, DepSec, DEF. Jake Sullivan from the National Security Council was leading the meeting. And the basic discussion was, what are you going to do in your agency to bring more biotech into it? OK, very exciting for the field. And then you know, about a month after that, right down the street uh, at, at the JFK Museum here in Boston, President Biden came in and announced a new agency getting created, ARPA-H. Okay? And this is modeled after DARPA. That's the research agency that gave us the internet. Right? Bring that kind of ambition and risk taking into developing health and medicine. And who did he pick to run this agency? Right there in the green, Renee Wegerson, who you're going to get to hear from today. And let me tell you, what did Renee do when she was back at DARPA? She ran the synthetic biology portfolio. OK, so this to me is a sign, you know, you're seeing this from the administration, that the types of technologies we expect to be, you know, the DARPA hard projects in health are going to come out of SynBio. And so excited to hear from Renee. She'll be interviewed by the wonderful Michael Spector. I'll highlight up in the library. You can get a free copy of Michael's new audiobook. A little plug, so check it out. Uh, super excited for that discussion. The other thing that happened on the government side was there's a, a National Security Commission for Emerging Biotechnology created. OK, it's got you know, two senators, two Congress people on it. I'm actually honored to be chairing this commission. There was a similar commission three years ago for AI that Eric Schmidt was the chair of. And, and this is highlighting, now you're talking about the defense sector and the defense part of Congress saying, hey, we want to know more about what's happening in bio biotech for both national security and strategic competitiveness reasons, national competitiveness. And so very happy to have you know, Michelle Rozo as the vice chair on that committee. She's going to be here uh, today previously uh, on the National Security Council. And there's an interesting interface between national security and public health that's going to happen here. And so we're also very honored to be joined by Richard Hatchett, who is the CEO of CEPI, just a global health champion who really did an enormous amount of work getting vaccines out uh, to the developed world during uh, the pandemic, and Megan Frisk who currently uh, is doing biotech policy coordinator for the US Department of State. OK, so it's going to be a very exciting panel. Uh, and, and we're uh, lucky to have Lieutenant General Tom Bostic to moderate it, a friend uh, of Ginkgo. Super excited about this. OK, 
we have not been on the sidelines at Ginkgo in, in this area, at this interface between national security and, you know, and public health, and we're lucky to have Matt McKnight heading up this business for us, and he's gonna speak to you today about our programs led by the CDC, that detected you know, first sequence cases of BA2 and BA3 uh, in the US were through this program and we're looking to expand that internationally now and, and Matt will tell you a lot more about that. So excited to be, to be working in this area. Okay, also in 2022, we had our big industry meeting, SynBioBeta, and Eric Schmidt gave the keynote. And this is what he said to the crowd. It's time to take the work of the last 10 or 20 years and make it scale to a global phenomena that is somewhere between four and $30 trillion of economy. You all will do that. That's why I'm here. That's a message for all of you, right, that are developing these products. And it's no surprise to me that you're seeing more of these tech leaders, right? Like Eric was CEO of Google 01 to 11, right, when the internet went through exactly that change, became that huge part of the economy. He knows it when he sees it, right? And, and these tech leaders are coming in in part, I think, because they recognize that just like in computers, in biology, we have a common code in this case, DNA code, that crosses all these different markets, right? And they saw this with software. You had Amazon Web Services, cloud computing, it's the same infrastructure for, for finance and for pharma, right? Same thing with operating systems. And so the argument was, could we do the similar thing for biotechnology? And that's what Ginkgo's been trying to do, a common platform for all markets in biotechnology to make it cheaper and easier and faster to develop cells. Lots of people said we would not be able to do this, okay? Uh, you know, that the robotics you would need for microbes versus mammalian cells wouldn't be the same. The AI models you would use would be different for pharma or ag. And I'm happy to say we're proving those folks wrong. So we have more than 80 customers on the platform now. This is just some of them. And I'll highlight, you know, it's big pharma names, Merck, Nova Nordisk, Biogen, in industrials, you know, in the chemical industry, Sumitomo, Jividon, Jividon's the largest uh, fragrance company in the world, Solve in Europe. Uh, in chemicals, in agriculture, just added Syngenta earlier this week, Corteva, Bayer's been a longtime customer, so the largest players across all three industries engaging with our platform. And then, importantly, many of the startups, right, the new future greats in these industries also. So for both small and large companies across industries, we are seeing adoption of the platform. Okay, and it's getting faster. Right, so in last year, we increased the number of active customer programs by 60% at Ginkgo, and the rate of new program launches by 90%. So, okay, investors care about this, that's exciting, the company's growing. I would argue all of you should care about this too. And the reason is that Ginkgo has a platform scale economic. The more customers we add to the platform, the better it gets. And by better, I mean it reduces risk for the cells you're engineering, it takes less time, and it costs less. And I'm gonna talk more about that in the talk. So, when we add customers, when you see a new announcement from Ginkgo, if you're one of our current customers, you should be happy, right? So, so please uh, send folks our way. All right, so what I wanna spend a little time about is I went out and talked to a lot of our customers about why are they partnering with Ginkgo, why are they using our platform? And I wanted to share a few quotes and kind of the big categories I hear from people. So this is from uh, Brian Vandal at Nova Nordisk, and you're gonna see him on a panel in a minute. It's not why I picked his quote. I actually think he's got this right. So he said, you know, science is currently undergoing a revolution large-scale data sets coupled with AI are opening up a greater opportunity space within biology. We no longer have to limit ourselves to the questions that can be addressed by traditional research methods. Okay, and this is, this is the key point. It, it is those large data sets plus AI means you can ask bigger and better questions in biology. And this is not just pharma R&D saying this. This is, if you're an auto company, if you're a financial company right now, if you're a healthcare system, you're asking, how is big data and AI going to impact what I'm doing, right? And so I think Brian's 100% right about this in pharma. We're super excited to have him. Uh, Chris Sander from uh, uh, the C Bio Center at Data Farber, and Josh Dunn, our head of design, uh, moderated by the wonderful Claire Evans to talk about this on our panel about AI meets bio in just a minute. Okay, so these are the big categories of why I think people are adopting outsource synthetic biology platforms. The first, what Brian said, more data per dollar. Second, you shouldn't only have access to your in-house data, right? Like you need much larger data sets to make this stuff work. So you actually wanna access data across the whole industry. Three, you want it to be fast. It needs to be faster than our current timelines in biotech. Four, if you're a small company, you wanna cut CapEx. Like you don't wanna have to build a lab, okay? And then five, you want it to be a variable cost. When you want a lot of R&D, you want to spend a lot, and when you don't, you want to just turn it off like a knob, okay? That's not how it works today with traditional biotech. All right, 
So I'm going to go through each of these. Uh, this is a, a cool video. So this is a, a um, we acquired a company called Zymergen in California last year. Uh, I encourage you to go check out our facility. It's 10 minutes from here. Uh, but this is, is really the leading technology for flexible lab automation uh, that allows you to swap in and out machines and great software to handle it and everything else. And, and the reason I show it to you is just as people developing products in synthetic biology, you should not need to be the world's experts in laboratory automation. You should not need to be the world's experts in liquid droplet management. Okay, these are things that Ginkgo can be expert in, and you can just access the latest technology so that you get more data per dollar. We are committed to doing that. That's what we're spending all our capital on. Okay, and you hear this, you know, this, this need for these big sets from our customers. Alphonse, who was at Biogen when we did that deal, said, we did the deal with Ginkgo to explore a large number of design ideas. Marcus Schindler, CSO at Nova Nordisk, we wanted to be able to rewrite whole genomes and engineer new bespoke biological systems. It was to access a scale that wasn't otherwise available in-house. Okay. Second, it shouldn't just be your data assets that are going into producing your product. Okay, and what Ginkgo is committed to doing is getting together as much data as possible around the industry and making it available to you. So you can see this in comments, you know, Jividon, it was the breadth of existing assets is why we work with them. With Merck, it was the experience of the employees, so our, our people's ability to use these assets. And at Sumitomo, the great transparency and sophisticated data set. So that, let's touch on that transparency for a minute. So, you know, with Bayer, we acquired the agricultural R&D unit uh, last year. All these other companies, we acquired the full set of IP, okay? If you're interested in the AAVs from Stride Bio, the Circular RNA from Circularis, all available to you transparently in our data set. But I'll highlight one thing here. This is a set of genomic data we have. Compared to the public database, there's 246 million uh, novel genes. This is in, in Uniprot. We have 2 billion in our, in our proprietary data set from all these acquisitions we've done. All available, right, to you as a service if you want to train you know, your models. Okay. Uh, so the third, we launch work quickly. We already have this infrastructure in place. So Trent, you know, at, uh, at Microba said, hey, Ginkgo's expertise and resources moved our drug discovery project along at a pace that would not be possible with either internal resources or a traditional CRO. Nicholas, uh, you know, CTO at LIGO said, you know, the team's talented. The early results on one of our projects are stunning and support LIGO's mission of accelerating the world's transition to high-performing, sustainable products. Okay, that one's interesting. We just announced that deal started six months ago. So how are you getting stunning results in six months? It's because you're not starting from scratch. Like we have to break this idea in biotech that we start every project from scratch. It was actually building on an enormous amount of bio resources we already had at Ginkgo, plus leveraging automation on the first day. All right, and finally, Bob Ryder, head of R&D at Bayer, they did a big deal with us to outsource both to us and to other companies, and, and Bob's saying, look, open innovation is letting me tap a wider set of data to bring product to market faster. Okay, all right. This one is for the smaller companies in the room. It's a great uh, comment here from Jasmina, CEO at Arkea. You know, Arkea was able to begin lab work in weeks without building out our own biotech capabilities. This was a brand new company. They had just raised money. What would normally happen? You'd call Alexandria, they would show you overpriced lab space in Kendall Square, you'd spend a fortune on a bunch of rent, you'd spend a fortune on a bunch of new equipment, and six to 12 months later, you'd get to start doing some work. Instead, Arkea was able to start in weeks, and it says, we were able to launch a compelling, differentiated product in less than two years. Had we not worked with Ginkgo, we'd never be able to move this fast or deliver as great of a product, and you should go check out their product. Go talk to the, uh, the Jasmina and the team, they're gonna be here, uh, about what they've been doing. But that speed is because the assets are already in place. The last point I'll make on this, this is what I would say a normal, like, startup life science therapeutics company looks like. At the beginning, so that dotted line is the R&D team that they build up at the start. At the beginning, they wish they had more research people. They want to get to that drug candidate faster. They want to try more designs so that they get a better drug to go into the clinic. Then it's, we got it, this is our shot, we're gonna put it in the clinic. Well, suddenly they want a smaller R&D team. They're like, oh, I want to spend all my money on the clinical trials, you know, right? I don't want to be spending money on some future stuff. I don't even know if this works yet. Then they get a good result. And suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, I want a big R&D team because I want to grow my pipeline. And the really ugly part of this is when the venture industry contracts and tightens like it is right now, in that little dip in the middle, what they do is they just lay off the R&D team. Okay, this is not an efficient way to run our industry. It would be more efficient for us to have services that provide variable cost R&D. You need a lot at the beginning, great. You need none when you start your clinical trial, turn it off. 
Okay, that, that would be more efficient. That's how compute works with Amazon Web Services. When you need it, you do, and you don't, you don't. Uh, we wanna create that in the area of, of research services. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are the five reasons. So let's say you hear all that, and you're like, okay, great, I wanna sign up. How do you sign up, right? So one thing, you just go to our website, you click, you say work with us, and you're gonna hear from our technical uh, you know, scientists who go engage with customers and commercial team, and they'll, they, this is like very easy. You can tell them what you want to do at Ginkgo, and they'll tell you if it's possible. But a lot of people, that doesn't really work. They're like, whatever, I don't really know if it's relevant to me. You know, can you, can you prove it to me? Can you show it to me? And so one of the things we did this year was we launched our first service offerings, Ginkgo Enzyme Services. And this was meant to say, if you are working on a protein project, an enzyme project, you should really be working with us. And we had a whole bunch of pre-existing data and all these things, and that worked great. So I'm happy to say uh, today we're announcing the launch of four new services, Ginkgo Microbe Services, Cell Therapy Services, AAV Services, and RNA Therapeutic Services. And this is built in part on some of the acquisitions we've done recently, Stride Bio and AAV, Circularis, the Bayer Agriculture uh, Biologics team out in West Sacramento. Those are all rolled into these services. And if you're excited to learn more about this, check out the events calendar. We have these great webinars, and we're gonna be sharing more materials in the coming months. Uh, you're also gonna get to hear from some of those scientists uh, that our customers are, are raving about that are sitting on top of these platform services. Emily Renbreck in just a minute uh, on, on sort of enzymes, uh, Shadi for RNA and cell therapy, uh, Magali in uh, microbes, and then Kenan, who just came in via the Stride Bio acquisition, will throwing him right in the fire. Uh, so he'll be, he'll be talking today uh, about that. Okay, uh, so the number one request we're getting from customers is to help them de-risk their cell engineering. All right, so yes, people want it cheaper, they want it faster, but they really want to take the technical risk out of the projects. And so you can see that, right? Nicholas at Ligos, as a CTO at a growing company, what could I possibly do better than working with Ginkgo to de-risk my plans? Keith at Optimvia, the likelihood of success was seen to be improved by the technical capabilities at Ginkgo, all right? So this is a tricky topic, right? So in enzyme services, we have now done enough programs that we have a sense of what is very likely to succeed and what is not. And we tell our customers that. Like, we're like, man, this is totally gonna work. And they're like, yeah, I don't believe you, right? Because no one in biotech really believes that anything is predictable. Like, it all is research. It's not, it's not like building bridges or cars. It's research, right? And so today at Ginkgo, we are announcing we're putting our money where our mouth is on these services. So for our mature services here, enzyme, discovery, optimization, and protein expression, we're moving to success-only payments. In other words, if we hit the technical goal, we get paid. If we don't, we don't. And that means that I am offering our customers what they want, which is de-risking. I'm taking that technical risk and I'm putting it on to us because we have confidence there and so you don't have to pay for that risk. All right, so really excited about this. If you want to learn more about it, enzymes at GinkgoBioWorks.com or check out the, the dome back there that has the T-Rex skull in it. You can talk to some of our commercial folks about this. I think it's going to be uh, a big deal. I'm really excited to, to pioneer this in the industry. Um, oh, actually, one quick story there, like an only in biotech story. So uh, when we announced our deal with Biogen a couple of years ago, it, it said, like, here's this new deal. It has a $5 million upfront fee. You know, okay. And there's this comment, like, I won't, I won't say the name, but like a biotech reporter on Twitter is like, $5 million upfront fee. Like, what's this, a deal for ants? You know, right? Like, like it's like, why is it so small? And, and I'm like, wow, how crazy is this, right? Like, like, let me tell you something customers do not like giant upfront fees, you know, right? You know, and, and so like what I'm, what I'm committing to you all is that we're gonna work to make things less expensive, to make them faster, and to reduce the risk in your projects. Like this starts with you. We are a services business. We want to do that. You won't see me like shooting for biotech headlines. You'll see me for making you guys more successful at a lower cost. All right, so I'll be clear about that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna end with this. Uh, biology lives in the world of atoms. Okay, we are made out of biology, the food we eat is made out of biology, the atmosphere is produced by biology, and as we develop these tools to program it, it is going to have deep impact on us and our lives, and we need to start asking the questions, discussing the ethics and impact today. Right, like you're seeing this in AI right now. Holy crap, everyone's talking about ChatGPT. What the biggest open issue is, is like they're worried about all the regulations and the ethics and what's going to happen, da, da, da. Like, like, like you need to have these conversations early in the technology curve. And so I'm really excited 
again, if I have not proven today is about learning, we literally have a library upstairs. Uh, go up there and get free copies of these books we really like on these topics. You're gonna hear from four amazing storytellers at the end of the, of the day today to open your minds on these topics. Our new edition of Grow Magazine. Uh, please, please, I think it's important for our, 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 collect, our collective uh, group to get smarter here. Uh, we're also gonna have a great panel on the future of plants. Uh, we have, I'm hoping we have Maddie Hall. She's having like travel issues, but uh, just so you give her her background, uh, she's the CEO of Living Carbon. Uh, it is a, a company that's genetically engineering plants to grow faster, uh, to take carbon out of the air, in, in this case, poplar trees. Uh, and then Ruth Wagner, who's the head of data science and analytics at Bayer Crop Science, can talk about all of the big data applied in plants and, and moderated by Nadia Berenstein. We should use plants to do more than make food, right? And so I think this is a really exciting area uh, to talk about. Uh, and then we're, we're super fortunate to have uh, John Maraganori uh, interviewed by uh, Jen Whiff, our head of commercial here at Ginkgo. And, and John was the founding CEO of Al Nylum. So he went through the experience of taking sRNA as a new modality and launching it to a $25 billion company with drugs and patients. How do we make that go faster? You know, what are the lessons we can learn? We're really lucky to hear from John. Okay, so I want to end on this. Uh, I, we talked a lot about AI today, and so I, I asked ChatGPT, I said, you know, what is more important to society? atoms or bits. He says, well, atoms and bits are both important to society. They play different roles and different implications. And it goes on about atoms and what bits are and all this. And I'm like, wow, like, this is really becoming human intelligence. This is like an impressive dodge of my question, right? And so, and so I'm like, no, 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 no. OK, Chappie T, but if you had to pick one, what is more important to society, atoms or bits? Well, if I had to pick one, I would say that atoms are more important to society. This is because atoms are the building blocks of the physical world. They're essential for our survival and our well-being. They make the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe. They make the materials that build our homes and roads and bridges. Without atoms, society would not be able to function in its current form. I could not have said it better, all right? Synthetic biology is the programming platform for programming in the world of atoms. At Ginkgo, we are trying to make that technology easier and better and faster so all of you can have that impact in the world. I cannot wait to see what you build with it, and I'm delighted to learn with you here today. Welcome to Ginkgo Ferment.